I want us to turn to the second chapter of John's Gospel, beginning with verse 23. Jesus had been traveling throughout the land of Palestine. He had been in, now he's in Galilee. And then he went on his way to Jerusalem to attend the feast of the Passover. And when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. These people believed in Jesus. These were very religious people. They were religious leaders. But they didn't believe on Jesus as their Lord and their Savior. And there are thousands of people here tonight that believe in Jesus Christ with your mind. You believe enough to go to church. You believe enough to engage in even Christian work and good works. But deep in your heart, you really don't know Christ as your Lord and your Master and your Savior. A newspaper article in Great Britain carried a headline a few weeks ago that said, a new world is being born. Yes, Jesus said it's possible to live a new life. He said in the next chapter, the third chapter of John, you must be born again. He said, if you're not born again, you'll never see the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. When Jesus said that to this great religious ruler who was a Pharisee and rich, he was in the revivalist movement of that generation. He belonged to the Sanhedrin, the highest ruling body in the nation. He was also a rich man, we find out. He was a Pharisee, and the Pharisees were considered the leaders of the country. Now, Nicodemus was the kind of man that most churches would be glad to have. But Jesus said, Nicodemus, all your good works and all your religious knowledge is not enough. You need something more. Jesus knew that man was capable of lying and cheating and hate and prejudice and social inequality. He said, out of the heart proceed evil thoughts and murders and adulteries and thefts and false witnesses and blasphemies. These are the things, he said, which defile a man. The Bible always describes the disease that we have as the free act of an intelligent, moral, responsible being. There are many words in the Bible that are translated sin. Many words. Transgression is one of them. Transgression means that we've broken the Ten Commandments, and every person here tonight has broken the Ten Commandments. Somewhere along the line, you told one lie. And the Bible says if you've broken one commandment, you've broken them all. So that means that you've broken all the commandments. And we haven't lived up to the Sermon on the Mount. We're missing the mark. All unrighteousness is sin, the Scripture says in 1 John 5, 17. Then there's iniquity. Iniquity means there's a turning aside from the straight path. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. The Bible teaches that the spirit is dead toward God. We have a body, but living inside is our spirit, and it's that spirit of ours that is going to live forever, either in heaven or hell. And the difference will be the decision that you make about Jesus Christ. Mark Twain was once asked, what are the two greatest words in the, in the English language? And he replied, not guilty. The two greatest words, not guilty. And that's what God is going to say to you at the judgment if you know Christ. If you don't know Christ, if you haven't had this relationship with Christ, you'll be declared guilty and suffer the consequences. 
Well, what is the new birth? What does it mean to start over? Nicodemus asked that question. How can a man be born when he's old? He wanted to understand it. But Jesus indicated to him that there's a mystery about it. He said in John 1, 13, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. You can be born in a garage, but that doesn't make you an automobile. You can be born in a Christian home, but that doesn't make you a Christian. He didn't say that you could be baptized and that would get you to heaven. Oh, you should be baptized after you come to Christ. Simon the sorcerer was baptized by Philip after having intellectually believed. But Peter told him, your heart's not right in the sight of God. You need, you need Christ or confirmation or whatever practice they have in your denomination, in your church. The conditions of belonging to the church were that you must first be saved. Some of you might have been saved by, at confirmation and some might not have been. I mean, only the Holy Spirit knows when a person is born again, when that line is crossed. I believe a person like Becky that spoke to us a few moments ago, she would say that day that she made that decision was the moment she was born again. I believe I know the day that I was born again, but my wife doesn't know the day. She knows she's always loved Christ. She cannot remember the day that she didn't love him and she can't remember the day when she didn't put him first in her life. Frederick the Great of Prussia was a professing Christian. He once invited Voltaire, the famous atheist, to a banquet. And during the toast, Voltaire said, I will barter my seat in heaven for one Prussian mark. After a silence, a fellow guest spoke up and said to Voltaire, Sir, in Prussia, we have a law that says before we can sell anything, we have to have proof of ownership. Can you prove that you have a seat in heaven? I ask you this, can you prove that you have a seat in heaven? The only way you can get a seat is to come to the cross and confess that you're a sinner and receive Christ as Lord and Savior and come to the empty tomb and believe that he rose again from the dead. Voltaire was speechless. He didn't know what to say. To be born again means to be born from above. The Holy Spirit of God comes in and gives you a new heart. You see, your old nature is no good. You have to have a new nature. You have to have a new heart. A new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you, says Ezekiel 36. In Acts, Peter called it repenting and being converted. In Romans, Paul speaks of it as being alive from the dead. In 2 Corinthians, he calls it being a new creation. Old things have passed away. Everything becomes new. Has that happened to you? It could happen tonight. It can happen right here. You don't have to wait some other day. You don't have to put it off. In Colossians, Paul calls it putting off the old man with his deeds and putting on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Just before I came here, a man in the city of Asheville near our home in North Carolina pulled a gun on the teller who handed him the money as instructed. But that man did not know that the bag also contained a die bomb. And when it exploded, it covered the money, the bag, and his hand with this die and he couldn't get it off and when they when they caught him the die was easy to see and because of sin we have die on our souls and we can't wash it off because of this die we're easily spotted and caught and brought to the judgment but Jesus can cleanse the die with his blood the only way to cleanse the die of sin is by the blood of Christ. 
The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin, the scripture says. And that's what you need tonight. Now what happens? Nicodemus asked Jesus, he said, how can it happen? What happens? Jesus said, there's a mystery to it. He used the analogy of the wind. He said, the wind blows where it listeth. You can't see it. You can't catch it. But you can feel it. You can see the effects of it. The Holy Spirit comes into our hearts and gives us a new nature and you can't pick it up and analyze it with your hands or put it in a laboratory. It's the work of the Spirit of God in you when you say yes to Christ. There's the analogy of the new birth. There's the moment of conception. There's the nine months of gestation. Then there's birth. And the scripture says, there's the reception of the Word of God, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. You hear the scripture quoted here tonight? You say yes to the Christ, conception, or it may be one other step in gestation, or it may be birth. I don't know. Only God would know that. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. There's something about the Word of God that has to do with your salvation. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching or declaration or proclamation to save them that believe. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. You see, He convicts you of sin. You become conscious of the fact that you've sinned. You've come short of what God requires. That's the work of the Spirit of God inside you. Then, when you receive Christ, he comes to indwell. He will indwell you. He will live in you. You don't have to leave here to live a Christian life, which you can't do by yourself. You have the Holy Spirit living in you to help you to live the Christian life. I couldn't live the Christian life an hour without the work of the Holy Spirit. And I'm a failure. I feel my sense of failure all the time. I'm not a great giant saint of God. People put a person who is publicized a little bit on, on a pedestal. I don't belong there. I belong in the gutter with all the sinners that have been saved by grace. I'm a sinner saved by the grace of God. Jesus uses an interesting illustration. He reaches over to the Old Testament and the people of Israel, when they were on their way out of Egypt, had all been bitten by serpents, snakes. And they were dying and suffering and screaming. And so Moses lifted up a serpent in the wilderness made of brass. And he said, if you look at that serpent, You'll be saved. You'll be healed. Well, that was absolutely foolish. There's no saving qualities or healing qualities in that brass. To just look and be saved. Think of it. That's all you have to do. And thousands of them did and they were saved, but thousands of them didn't. They thought it was too foolish and too ridiculous and too simple. And that's the way some of you think about the gospel of Christ and you think about the cross and the resurrection. It's too simple. It can't possibly be true. What Becky said can't be true. What has been sung here tonight can't be true. It's too, it's too easy, it's too simple. See, you come to Christ, that's easy in a way, because you have to repent of sin. That means that you have to say to God, I'm sorry I'm a sinner. I'm willing to turn from my sin, but Lord, I'll need your help even when I give these things up. I can't do it by myself.